Good morning or afternoon or evening. My name is Neville Swade and I'm the director of the Access Program based at the CSIR in South Africa. I'm recording this in August 2022 and I'm uh, going to give you a few words of welcome uh, to this course. I'm very glad that we have so many people participating as we normally do. Um, I'm sure you will find it interesting and I'm very much uh, keen to hear from you guys. So if you have something you want to ask or say, please use that email below. Uh, I thought I'd start uh, my introduction with a little bit of, of theory. Uh, this is an interest of mine uh, in my research and the research that we conduct in Access with a whole wide range of people. And I'll take you through this. This is from a paper which was published in 2018, which is really quite conceptual with some examples. And what it tells us is if you look at that green line on the top, what you will see is you will see a seasonal signal. And it's a noisy signal, but it's fairly regular. You can see some seasons are, are more extreme than others. Uh, some seasons are longer than others. And it's quite a bumpy and noisy signal, but fairly repeated and regular. The next line is the red line. And those are extreme events or periodic events which exceed what might be a long-term average. We call those extreme events, and you'll be very familiar with these. Currently, there are these incredible heat waves in Europe. Uh, we have in South Africa many examples. The latest one, most recent one, being the floods in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, these happen in a, in a regular way. Um, not that predictable, but <clears throat> there's a certain frequency of these extreme events, and they are, in a sense, quite natural. The impacts perhaps not, but certainly the occurrence is. And then on the bottom, you've got the blue line uh, in the top panel, and that's a gradual change, and that's the changing average. That's the, the, the signal from climate change. And if you combine those three lines together, you get the black line below the, the two stripes. And though that black line, you will see the seasonal signal, you will see the extreme events, and you will see the uh, slow increase, the, the climate change uh, driver. And really what this is telling us is that extreme events are really very, very important because uh, as the seasonal signal um, uh, brings us to extremes of the season, be it winter or summer, and by the way, those uh, points could go um, uh, either way. They can go negative or positive. In other words, you can get very hot weather or very cold weather, as the case may be. But they cause the slow process of increasing of the environmental parameters, trends in the environmental parameters are pushing us, these extreme events actually put us in new record territory. And that's why extreme events are really important. And the seasons and the extreme events are really, really critical elements to understand, or well, there are a currency of climate change. The bottom line is a fictitious population which can recover from extreme events. But if they happen too frequently or too strongly, they push us all into new records. They can push us over a limit where populations can't recover. And this is a very important principle on the basis of which we're doing quite a lot of research uh, in the world generally and in South Africa. And extreme events and seasonal changes, the changes to seasons are really important. And what uh, the International Panel for Climate Change of the UN uh, FCCC program has shown is that uh, extreme events extreme climate events are happening more intensely. And what does in more intensely mean? It means more frequently, it means for longer duration, it means with greater magnitude. And as this starts to manifest, so we see the impacts of climate change on our society. Okay, so that's the theory. Um, what are people doing about it? Well, there's lots and lots that's happening, as you probably know. I'm going to focus on one piece of work that uh, I've been involved in, and that's instituting what's called a National Framework for Climate Services. And this is to consolidate all of the work and all of the information uh, being gathered and in, to understand precisely what it is that users need in order to cope or deal with these extreme events and changing climate in general. And so there's a structure being put in place uh, which comprises various components, but very important is right at the top of the users because the idea is to co-generate the science that's required by various sectors in the economy. And I'm going to give you an example of that right now. Uh, but this is a very important way in which we can engage with these, project, uh, these problems. 
And I want to say that uh, people such as yourselves should be able to find a place in this process because it requires a lot of science, but it also requires a lot of users. It also requires social scientists, economists, etc., etc. So that's just a framework which I wanted to point out. And to tell you that um, uh, one of the things we're looking at is the observational capacity. How well do we observe our climate in South Africa? And we're under pressure here, not only because of the changing climate, but because of funding that's available. And what you're looking at here are weather stations uh, in, the, in, the, in South Africa from three um, uh, 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 different organizations. The South African Weather Service here on the top left, where the automatic weather stations are and their rain gauges are. This is the Agricultural Research Council's network. This is a private company called iLeaf, which is providing services to the agricultural sector. And this is just a combination of the South African Weather Service and Agricultural Research Council. And I thought I'd show you that because it shows you where some of the gaps are, uh, where some of the real focused concentration is. And again, to point out that all kinds of, of inputs are required, both the technicians who uh, install and maintain these services, as well as the scientists who use the data and interpret it. Now, I wanted to give you an example of a piece of work that uh, I'm involved with here in Cape Town, where I live. And this is to do with the Port of Cape Town. And the Port of Cape Town is the third most important port in South Africa in terms of volume. Uh, but it's very, very important in terms of fruit exports. So most of our fruit, about 90% of our fruit, is exported through Cape Town's container berth, which is located here at number two. And there are, there's an idea to expand this container berth so that we can handle more because there's pressure, economic pressure, on the port to, uh, to grow uh, uh, the capacity of this particular harbor. But it suffers from a very interesting and severe problem. And that problem is as follows. In um, the cases of extreme wind, uh, which we get in Cape Town, the whole uh, system grinds to a halt. Uh, I'll just take you through this. There are ships involved and they're on an international schedule and they decide uh, when to stop. And if, the, if there's a backlog in Cape Town Harbor, they simply drive on or sail on uh, to the next port. And so people who want to exchange goods in Cape Town have to truck their goods or containers to other ports, which adds costs. Getting pilots on board ships depends on the sea state. And if the sea state's bad, it's a problem. Uh, managing the cranes and the movement of, of um, goods off the ship really are hampered by extreme wind and, in fact, ocean conditions. Sometimes the ships move, which makes it very, very dangerous. And so there's a, a limit to how, uh, how strong the wind is. Uh, there's a threshold above which they can't continue. And then there are a whole lot of other companies uh, which are involved, uh, customs clearance, uh, ships agents, etc., etc. <clears throat> and so if the ship cannot make port or cannot offload its cargo, it causes delays. And that has a huge knock-on effect on the economy. Ultimately, it is the companies that import and export through the harbor and depend on the efficient running of the port for this whole economy to, to function. As I said, 90% of our fruit is, um, is exported here. And fruit is very time sensitive. Although it's refrigerated, it does spoil after a period of time. So this graph shows us how, much, how many hours are lost per month for the last 10 years. And you will see that some years are worse than others. Uh, some months are worse than others. You can see it's very seasonal. Our peak season for wind is between uh, October and February, usually, uh, and it seems that these winds are getting worse. And this is the problem that we are looking at. Are the winds getting worse? Does the data support that that theory? And why is it getting worse? And what are the, are the climatological reasons for this? And what is the economic impact? And ultimately, what can we do about it? Right? And these are the questions we're looking at. And so this is an example of how extreme events affect our systems. And this is just one example. There are very many, of course. Um, now, what you're looking at here is a very interesting graph on the export of containers with fruit in them through the Cape Town port. The red line is an average. And you'll see that the peak week for export of fruit from Cape Town is in uh, week eight, which is in the end of February. It starts to pick up the season for export, starts to pick up 
around uh, late September, October, peaks in February, and then tails off uh, for the year. And this coincides, as it happens, with our peak wind season, and that's not a coincidence. This has got to do with summer winds, which is not abnormal, as I'll show you at the end of this little presentation. But if the winds are becoming more strong and affecting the ability of the harbor to function, of the port to function, then there's a problem which we have to, we have to understand better and understand exactly where the problem lies and what engineering we can do to cope with it. Uh, this is just on the right hand side to show you where this fruit ends up, actually, which is quite fascinating in and of itself. Um, and uh, I wanted to point out that there's a value chain. It starts with a farmer, goes you know, through the managing of the orchards to packing houses, cold storage, then transport to the port, through onto a vessel, uh, to a foreign port where it gets trucked again, sometimes to another packing house, then to a retailer, then to a consumer. And all of these are affected by any pinch points in the process. And those pinch points at the moment are in the ports. Where, uh, where there are delays caused by wind, but also by other factors. And really, the question is, who's losing money because of the wind? And if we can understand that question, who's losing the money, then we can say, well, we're losing X amount of money. We can therefore justify spending Y amount of money on building more infrastructure uh, to cope with the wind, especially if we can say with, with confidence that the wind might get worse, the extreme wind might get worse in 10 years' time, for example. So that's how we kind of look at these problems in an end-to-end -end way. And they're very important, as I say, from an extreme event point of view. And there are others like extreme rainfall, extreme drought. Uh, you're all very familiar with the Cape Town drought. Uh, interestingly, on that one, the Cape Town drought, the day zero drought, wasn't the worst drought on record. The difference between the previous time and this time was that there was a much bigger population which had a much greater need for water. Okay. Um, I just wanted to point out that this is an economics model, and I'm not going to explain it to you, mostly because I don't understand it properly. But really, it's a demand curve, trying to understand what services we can uh, render to, uh, to the public in terms of climate observations, and what demand there is for climate observations. So more and more companies and businesses are, are using climate information for a variety of different applications. Some is for the actual business model, the other is for investment purposes, et cetera, et cetera. But um, this is a supply and demand curve where we are trying to understand why uh, it's worth investing in more infrastructure for observations. Now, I only show this just to demonstrate that it's really important that we have economists that work on Earth systems, uh, because without them, we can't really translate the science into very usable information. So that's what I wanted to show with that slide. And then I'm going to finish by showing you uh, two models. This one, which I hope will run now. Yes, it's running. This model is a, a model of the world's weather. And uh, it's an old model, but it makes the point. Uh, and you can see the trade winds, and you can see the equatorial regions of the world. And the orange colors represent precipitation. So this is a cloud level, if you like. And, and what I want to demonstrate with this is that everything is connected. Our, our, our climates are connected. So when there's an El Nino event, which you will learn about in this course, when there's an El Nino event, for example, uh, in, in the Pacific, uh, the impacts are felt right across the world because the amount of moisture that is uh, produced uh, at different parts of the world changes. Uh, and same with the La Nina, which we had in South Africa last year in 2021, which does explain some of the flooding that we had. Anyway, uh, you'll see Africa here on the on the left hand side, and you'll see the cold fronts. Now, if you look at this, where does the water that lands in Africa come from? Well, it comes from the tropics. Ultimately, it comes from the tropics, and it moves with a jet stream down south, and then back onto the land, and that's where our rainfall comes from, at least in the Western Cape. In the, the northeast of our country, most of the rainfall is tropical. And this is just a very interesting, you can see these little tropical storms that are happening here. Sometimes they're very big. This goes through time. We're looking in March now, which is uh, towards the end of summer. We're going to go into April. And I'll talk a little bit more so that we can run into July. And you'll see how more of those cold fronts make it over the Western Cape. Because the Western Cape has a summer, uh, sorry, a winter rainfall area where the rest of the country really has a, a summer rainfall uh, pattern. And that's a very important difference and makes South Africa very special in the sense that we have two quite distinct 
climate regimes, um, one uh, uh, driven by these cold fronts that come off the Southern Ocean, uh, as opposed to uh, the tropical systems which provide the rainfall in summer uh, in the north of the country. So here we are in May, and I hope you are keeping your eye on this region here to watch um, how these systems change. And if you were to compare July, a snapshot of July with a snapshot of, say, January, you'd see that the, the band of tropical moisture moves up and down with the seasons. And that, that is one of the features of seasonal change. So here we are in June, and very shortly we will be in July, which is kind of midwinter. We have most of our rain in June in Cape Town, as it happens, uh, which is quite surprising. You'll see that cold front, for example, just whipping past the, the, the coast, and you might see one that will run right through the country, and sometimes that even results in snow um, inland, which is, again, very important to us. That one kind of whipped through. That one caused a cutoff low. Um, I'm just trying to see if we get one more. I'll just let it go till the 15th, and then we'll, we'll move on. Okay, so here's a nice cold front going right through the country, as you saw it there. Okay, good. Um, then I'm going to send uh, send you guys off with this slide, and this is just another wind slide. So uh, just as an example, this was really a proper extreme. This was in 2017, and we have a big event in Cape Town every year called the August, it used to be called the August Cycle Tour. It's now called the Cape Town Cycle Tour. And um, people come from all over the world and all over the country to ride the cycle tour from the city center around the Cape Peninsula back to, uh, to Seapoint, Greenpoint, part of Cape Town. And in this year, uh, we had an extreme wind event, and they had to cancel the race. And I want you to watch these guys on their bicycles, and look at these people over here who are all sheltering from this extreme wind. It's a bit unfair because this is a very famous spot for wind in Cape Town. It's the foreshore, and this particular tall building actually channels the wind and actually makes it even worse than normal. And then following this, you will see... Another a little bit of footage from an uh, um, extreme wind event uh, near the mountains of Cape Town, uh, which caused traffic disruption. So just have a look at this. So now you'll see the wind is blowing so strongly that this guy can't even keep his bike on the ground. Okay, he never might get on his bike. Nobody could cope with this. And this guy, in, you'll see the guy in the red shirt, can't move. He's just trying to stay standing and not succeeding. So you'll see how incredibly strong the wind can get, okay? And these are gusts. It's not like this consistently, but really, really bad. Uh, and so they had to cancel the race. And this is the footage I was telling you about. Look on the right-hand side at the white truck that's just appearing in the image. Have a look at that. Watch that truck. And wham, over it goes. Just blown over by the wind. And that's how strong the wind can get. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to show you and uh, just entice your imagination and hope that you will learn a lot and enjoy the course and uh, we look forward to hearing from you guys thanks a lot cheerio